welcome back to Teen Story Share. This week we're going to be reading a new book for the month of August. And this one is a non-fiction book. So a little bit of a change from our usual fiction. And I think the title says it all. The Ouida, a pirate ship feared, wrecked, and found by Martin W. Sandler. All right, we're going to jump right in. Oh, and quickly, we do only have three weeks of teen story share this month because the last story share for this month is August 20th. And after that, your friendly neighborhood library staff will be taking a little break to get ready for fall programming. So we'll be back in September. Introduction. In 1984, newspaper headlines and television newscasts around the world announced that the wreck of the pirate ship Ouida had been discovered off Cape Cod. The Ouida was the first sunken pirate ship ever to be found. It had lain undiscovered for so long, almost 300 years, that many had come to wonder if it had ever existed, if the incredible stories they had heard about the ship, its crew, and its amazing cargo of treasure were actually myths. The stories connected with the Ouida are tales of pure adventure, populated by colorful characters, including one of the boldest and most successful pirates ever. Filled with outlandish deeds, amazing courage, barbarous acts, triumphs, and tragedy, the stories are made even more extraordinary by the fact that they are true. The saga of the Ouida continued after it went down, and this part of its story is, in many ways, as fascinating as the tales of deeds and misdeeds aboard the ship when it rode the high seas. In the ordinary course of events, ships that outlive their usefulness are stripped or broken apart. But over the centuries, many have been shipwrecked, so many, that much of human history lies hidden beneath the waves. Famed oceanographer Robert Ballard has described shipwrecks as the pyramids of the deep. I think there's more history in the deep, he has said, than in all the museums in the world combined. <coughs> When Will you just go away? Why are there people? When a ship sinks, it becomes a time capsule. If it is salvaged like the Ouida, it provides evidence of what ships were like and what life was like at the time of its sinking. The Ouida was not only the first sunken pirate vessel to be discovered, it was also the first pirate ship to be excavated. Marine archaeologists have uncovered artifacts in its wreck that have changed our entire notion of who the pirates were and how they lived. Pirates have long been the subject of legend and literature, and considerable imagination. But the true story of pirates is every bit as fascinating as the fiction they spawned. Chapter 1. The Slave Ship Ouida in February 1717, Captain Lawrence Prince was heading home, back to England, on his ship the Ouida, which was loaded with a fortune in gold, silver, and other valuable goods. It was the final leg of the magnificent vessel's highly It was the final leg of the magnificent vessel's highly successful maiden voyage. Formerly named the Ouida Galley, the ship was built in 1715 for Sir Humphrey Morris. A member of British Parliament, Morris was one of the most active slave traders of his day. His new ship, named for the infamous West African slave trading port Ouida, was constructed to carry captured Africans to Caribbean plantations, where sugar, rice, tobacco, indigo, and other highly valued products were grown. There, the captives would be sold into slavery. Morris selected Lawrence Prince to be the ship's captain. It was an understandable choice, as Prince was well suited to command a ship constructed for such a brutal purpose. He had spent several years serving under the feared Welsh privateer Captain Henry Morgan, who had been employed by England to capture or destroy Spanish ships and raid Spanish towns in the Caribbean. That Prince could be ruthless in carrying out his duties is evidenced by an official Spanish government report of a raid he led on a town in Nicaragua. Prince, the report stated, made havoc and a thousand destructions, sending the head of a priest in a basket and demanding 70,000 pesos in ransom. 
1671, Prince helped lead Morgan's raid on Panama. His share of plunder from the attack allowed him to retire to Jamaica, where he lived as a prosperous landowner. In 1671, Prince helped lead Morgan's raid on Panama. His share of plunder from the attack allowed him to retire to Jamaica, where he lived as a prosperous landowner for more than 40 years, before being given command of the Weta. It was an impressive ship, three-masted and 102 feet long. It featured the most advanced nautical technology available, including state-of-the-art steering mechanisms and the most up-to-date navigational and sounding equipment. It was armed with 18 cannons and had room for 10 more. Extremely strong, the Weta could carry 300 tons of cargo. Most impressive of all, it was fast, capable of traveling over the waves at the then amazing speed of just over 13 knots, or 15 miles per hour. Among the ship's most visible features was a long platform on its deck for captives who could not fit in the vessel's huge hold during the long voyage from Africa to the Americas. They would be shackled to the platform, lying side by side, exposed to all weather, with a barrier separating the male prisoners from the women and children, many of them their wives, sons, and daughters. Early in 1716, with Captain Prince at its helm, the Weta set sail from England loaded with cloth, firearms, gunpowder, liquor, hand tools, utensils, and other trade goods. The ship sailed along the west coast of Africa, passing what is today the Gambia, Senegal, and Nigeria, until it reached Weta, its namesake port. There, Prince exchanged his cargo for almost 400 slaves. The price Prince paid for each of the slaves is not known, but records from the Royal African Company, one of the world's largest traders in slaves, show that in 1731, the company bought 40 slaves in Ouida by trading 337 rifles, 40 muskets, and 530 pounds of gunpowder. The Weedas' voyage from England to West Africa was the first leg of the infamous slave trading route known as the Triangular Trade. Once the 400 slaves were crammed aboard his ship, Prince set sail across what is called the Middle Passage, headed for the Caribbean island of Jamaica. It was an almost 10-week voyage, during which nearly 20% of the captives died. The slavers did not provide enough food, and they packed their captives as tightly as possible. In these conditions, diseases such as smallpox, measles, and dysentery often spread out of control. Some of the slaves tried to commit suicide by throwing themselves overboard, but they were prevented from doing so by the special netting installed all around the deck. Despite their ordeal, 312 unfortunate souls survived and were dropped off at a huge Jamaican sugar plantation, where they were forced to work for the rest of their lives. Prince, on the other hand, received fortune in gold, silver, and other valuables from the plantation owners to take home to the Weedas owners in exchange for having delivered his human cargo. Prince was little concerned about the slave's horrific plight. He would have focused on getting home as quickly and as safely as possible, and being rewarded with the handsome payment he would surely receive. As the Weeda was proceeding in waters off the West Indies, two distant specks came into view. It soon became apparent that they were heading toward the Weta. Could they be two friendly vessels, their captains anxious to exchange news and gossip with a fellow mariner? Could they be anti-slavery warships, determined to capture or destroy vessels engaged in the slave trade? Or could they be pirates? The last possibility struck terror into the hearts of every ship owner and captain. And here's the map that's showing the triangular bout. And here is the map showing the triangular bout where the ships sailed from Europe down to West Africa to trade European trade goods for captives and then across to the Caribbean where they sold the captives into slavery in exchange for other goods 
Caribbean goods and then back to Europe. Prince and his crew had no way of knowing from this distance that the two specks were indeed pirate ships. Not only that, but they were commanded by a man who, in the space of just one year, had become one of the most feared pirate captains of his day. The Evil Institution Slavery did not begin in the Americas. What came to be called the Evil Institution? existed in every ancient civilization, including Arabia, Greece, and the Roman Empire. The transportation of more than 12 million slaves from West Africa to Europe's American colonies, however, was one of the largest mo movement. The transportation of more than 12 million slaves from West Africa to Europe's American colonies, however, was one of the largest movement of slaves in history. The Caribbean islands had everything needed for the establishment of a thriving plantation system, extensive open land, fertile soil, good harbors, and a climate perfectly suited to growing raw materials that were in demand throughout Europe. Everything, that is, except the enormous number of laborers needed to do the backbreaking work that growing and harvesting plantation crops required. The plantation owners found their answer in slave labor and made their fortunes on the backs of millions of captured African men, women, and children. The slave owner's continued prosperity was based on the labor of generations of captives who were born into slavery on their plantations. Many of the millions of captives who were taken from Africa to the New World were kidnapped by African tribal chiefs and then sold to British slave merchants called factors who lived in Africa. Others were taken prisoner in tribal wars started by these chiefs for the sole purpose of acquiring captives to be sold. The slave rosters also included those who had been convicted of crimes. In some cases, African chiefs fabricated crimes so that they could increase the number available to be sold into slavery. Millions of others were captured by British, British Millions of others were captured by British slave traders who traveled inland to ambush and seize local men, women, and children. After being taken, these captives were chained in long lines called coffles and forced to walk as many as a thousand miles to the coast, where they were held, sometimes for as long as a year, in prisons called factories, until a slave ship like the Ouida arrived. People were kidnapped from all corners of Africa, from grasslands, farmlands and cities, such as Luango and Timbuktu, vital centers of scholarship and learning. They included the wealthy as well as the poor and artists whose work was highly valued throughout the world. Slavery is traumatic and dehumanizing, and the psychological damage Africans suffered when torn from their homes, families, native land, and everything else they cherished was as devastating as the physical pain and cruelty they would experience once transported and sold. An unspeakable tragedy for millions. Being enslaved was eloquently described by one of the very few slaves to leave behind an account of his feelings and experiences. Ghana native Kobna Otoba Kuguano. Here is a picture of one of the compounds where enslaved people would be held until they could be transported over to the Caribbean plantations. An unspeakable tragedy for millions being enslaved an unspeakable tragedy for millions, being enslaved was eloquently described by one of the very few slaves to leave behind an account of his feelings and experiences, Ghana native Kobna Otoba Kuguano. An unspeakable tragedy for millions, being enslaved was eloquently described by one of the very few slaves to leave behind an account of his feelings and experiences. Ghana native Kobna Otoba Kuguano. 
It would be needless, he wrote, to give a description of all the horrible scenes which we saw, and the base treatment which we met with in this dreadful captive situation. Let it suffice to say that I was thus lost to my dear indulgent parents and relations, and they to me, brought from a state of innocence and freedom, and in a barbarous and cruel manner conveyed to a state of horror and slavery. And next time we're going to get back to that little encounter between the slave ship and the two pirate ships on the horizon in chapter two, A New Pirate King. Join us again next week for a teen story share. Bye. Thanks for joining us and I'll see you again next week.